Ding dong, bing bong, tick tock. What are you got? What are you doing? What are you up to? You just hanging out? You just making magic? You just chilling like villains on penicillin? Oh my goodness gracious, dude! It is. It just started raining over here in Nashville, and I was like, "What do I want to do? Do I want to? Do I want to make food? It's. I. I guess I do. Right? High protein, low sodium. Right? Cut my carbs in half. Okay. <laughs> drinking my water. Crocker Capital's in the building. What's up, sexy man? You drinking your water too? It's a Spartacus. <laughs> I need a Sparta hug. Like like now. Crocker Capital, you can hook up a Sparta hug. Maybe it's only Spartacus that can hook up a Sparta hug. What up, dudes? So stoked to see you guys. Um, dude, TikTok just updated. So maybe, maybe we're gonna get some some amazing views. Um, and what's up, girl? I'm so stoked to see you. What are you doing? Are you riding horses right now, dude? You shouldn't be texting and riding. You, are you TikToking and, and flip flopping? <laughs> what's up, girl? Some of my favorite people in the building, man. Wow, how magical! I love this. This is why I love going like live sporadically. I just it just hits all the right people at all the right times, dude. What's up, Janet? So stoked to see you. Oh my God, you're on, Britt. Britt, what's up, girl? Dude, I'm on every other day. What are you talking about? Why you been missing me? You, you get? Are you are you not on TikTok enough? I like live here. Welcome, <laughs> my man, Rob. What's up, dude? So stoked to see you, man. You're my favorite. Goodness gracious, dude. I'm so stoked. I just put a video out. Um, like a few seconds ago, man. I, I gotta say this first. If you guys, I guess Threads is the new place. I know Crocker Capital is over on Threads. I just jumped on Threads. I guess it's like a, a Twitter kind of like replace. I don't want to say replacement. I'm not a fan of Twitter, but I am on Threads, man. And what I'll be talking about on Threads is gonna be a little bit more aggressive, more raw, right? So if you guys haven't found me, Beyond Sober, just type in KOHDI on Threads. Hit me up over there if you guys, if we're already friends on IG, then my profile thing has that little button. You guys just add me over there. We're not moving over there. We're just pulling some of the conversation over there. I trust you with my life. You're an angel. I trust you with your life. You're the angel. You're the one that's taking care of you when I'm not around, dude. I trust you. Paulina Vibes in the building. What's up, girl? So stoked to see you. Hey, welcome, everybody. If you guys haven't followed me already, my name is Cody Rain. I am an ex-alcoholic, liver failure survivor, creator of the world-famous Beyond Sober Sobriety Masterclass and the Unlabeled Recovery Program. I spend all of my waking moments, start to finish, helping people take care of themselves or recover from self-sabotage, abuse. Um, I know what it's like to, to spend 18 months, almost two years of your life recovering after death, man. If you guys don't know my story, um, I, I turned bright yellow, was throwing up blood, um, was in four different hospitals. The surgery has cost about $1.5 million. And because I have a second opportunity at life, I can help people in, not just improve their quality of life, but actually recover from physical, emotional, spiritual damage caused by imbibing an actual toxin. No, I'm not here to get people to quit drinking alcohol. You guys drink, you're gonna drink regardless. I just want us all to be happy, healthy people as close to that as possible. So if we do decide to consume, we are drinking from a happy, healthy place. That way we get happy, healthy results. Mama Wolves in the building, the revolution is here. It will be televised and it is, let's grow. I'm so stoked to see you girl. Um, dude, if you guys are not following Mama of Wolves, she is not only just like taking over TikTok, dude, but she has her own platforms, own programs, own massive communities. Not only is she a Beyond Sober graduate, I call her the revolution because she literally has revolutionized what health, happiness, sobriety, and recovery looks like. She's taking things to a whole new level. That is, that's my sister right there, man. When I'm not around, she, she is. And I love this because she she embraces all that life is to the best of her ability. And she's actively helping people take care of themselves. We're all in the same game. We're all making sure that we're moving. Crocker Capital, he's, he's the guy you want to follow. He's the guy you want to connect with because he helps you invest with confidence, dude. When I see all these crypto stock market dudes and all this stuff, I'm like, no, nah, I'm just going to save all my dollars. He goes, no, you don't want to do that. You want to invest with confidence, and he's the guy that helps you not just understand that, but develop a whole new perspective on trading stocks and options, and uh, helps you literally set your life up uh, for financial success, man. So if you're not following Crocker Capital, man, he is totally worth your follow, dude. On that, um, I just put a video out because this is going to be my second 
Video, bro, straight out of Eight Mile. That's true. I was raised with hip hop, dude. I was raised in the underground. I was listening to Eminem before he was on the radio. I was listening to Eminem bef when he was bootlegged on b a blue cassette tape. <laughs> we were bumping Eminem before he was Eminem. We were listening to him when he was uh, when he was Marshall Mathers before he even came out um, at, like public. And uh, we listened to him on the Infinite album, which is one of his bootlegs. He, we were listening to him off LimeWire. Super powerful stuff. So you're right. Straight out of 8 Mile. Do rags to riches type circumstances. Um, I've been dead on drugs in jail. And uh, none of those has stopped me from reaching success, man. And I continue to show up. LimeWire, bro. Remember those viruses? Napster, too. 100%. Dude, I forgot about the nap. Dude, <laughs> that's a good movie too. Was it Napster or the social the social network? Super powerful. Um, stop your showing my page. Not sure what that means. <laughs> you act like I have control of your page, and I don't. Don't make no phone calls. I'm downloading MP3s. Yeah, 100% with the dial up, bro. Oh my goodness gracious. So I just put a video out a few minutes ago. Someone tagged me in someone else's video. Okay, age not page. Not sure what that means. Um, and they tag me because it's about that woman who was on the plane. There's this rising concern for that woman. And because we are all humans and we are concerned for other people, we want to know that she's okay. I too want to know that she's okay. The interesting part about that specific circumstance and the, the we're going to say split and diverse commentary that's happening on not just my video, but other people's videos as well, is they think that there's no possible way that that woman was intoxicated. They don't think that she was she was drinking. He said, showing her age. Oh, I get you. <laughs> I get it. Showing her age. Got it. Um, Cody motherfucking Ray. What's up, girl? Sammy Lee Grieving Trauma Coach. My ADHD kicking in. You guys want to follow Sammy too. She's not only an advocate. She has been through more life-altering circumstances associated with grief and trauma. That's not why she's the lead grief and trauma coach for the official Beyond Sober program. But she's also got the Grief Atlas. Um, she, she's your go-to if you're specifically struggling with any type of grief and trauma in your life. You want to follow her. She's absolutely phenomenal. Sweet person. Super bubbly. Super funny. She's off the chain. Now, check this out. We're all looking at this woman on the plane and going, she's having a breakdown. She's seeing things. There's this split on this going, she's having a religious experience. She's seeing demons. There's, hey, what's up, Derek? There's the other side of this saying that it's like demonic possession. There's another area of it saying that like um, she's, you, obviously she's hallucinating. Um, there's a few, I, I don't know, just all of them. I'm trying to think of like all, all the like staples. But there's a lot of people that don't understand um, what high functioning alcoholism is. Um, don't understand what psychosis is. 5150, we just think that they're crazy. Some of the craziest people you'll ever meet are also the most intelligent and highly informed. Um, it's very rare that, um, I, I've met some like truly crazy people, but they spit knowledge, man. There's the crazy, crazy, they're not even here, they're not even, their consciousness isn't even aware of itself, and they're operating on autopilot. There's people who have done an extensive amount of drugs and fried a lot of their, their ability to think effectively. And when we bring this into the arena, uh, thanks for PD. When we bring this into the arena, hang on, did you use other substances? I did. Um, I tried pills, man. I took a lot of MDMA. Um, I was a rave kid. Fried a lot of those nerve endings, fried a lot of those brain cells. Um, I didn't do anything hard, smoked, drank a majority of my life because it was legal. Um, I grew up in like a really rural, small town, so we basically got whatever we could get our hands on. Um, but alcohol became my staple. I, I developed alcoholism. I, I started getting a touch of the lism. Mama of Wolves, the revolution, that's what we're starting to, that's what I'm starting to do. A touch of the lism. I'm getting a touch of the lism. Once we catch a touch of the lism, it's, it's only a matter of time before it becomes full-blown alcoholism. Um, and long-term use, like the way that I did, having four more drinks a day, Partying every weekend or partying every night, having a high tolerance, drinking to get drunk, blackout, pass out, all that stuff. Two days sober, I'm so stuck for you. Um, did AA help me? They helped me realize that I was going to die there. So I decided to go to the gym instead. So AA did absolutely nothing for me personally with the program. 
but they did show me what I didn't want. So I have to say thank you to AA because because of that experience, I've been able to create two powerful, powerful programs that are more effective than AA. Just because they're not known around the world doesn't mean they don't bring permanent recovery. So I appreciate AA. I love that AA did all of the amazing things, continues to do the amazing things for the right people. The unfortunate part about AA is 95% of people relapse and don't go back, which puts them back into the 76 million people that are struggling right now with sobriety that know that AA won't work for them. That's why we have the Beyond Sober Masterclass and the Unlabeled Recovery Program, Single Shot Method, and all of our other platforms that we use use to help people take care of themselves. Um, Moving on to this topic, man, if you're continuously or even casually consuming alcohol, you are imbibing a literal toxin, a carcinogen that's capable of causing seven different types of cancer. It's a poison, rots your body from the inside out, literally, physically shrinks your hippocampus, makes your brain smaller. Um, aside from that, it's frying the nerve endings. 3,000 likes, by the way, thank you so much. Um, it fries the nerve endings in your brain, which means you fire codes not as fast, you get slow. This is what happens. This is this is why we have brain fog. <laughs> if we if we know anyone, six days sober. I'm so proud of you, dude. Um, is hearing voices in your sleep messed up my dreams? Normal going sober? Yeah, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so the trip is is that alcohol is going to over a long period of time or a lot of alcohol in a short period of time is going to physically literally capsize your your cerebral boat. It means that it's just going to make your mental health get worse. It's going to lower your physical health. When those things get out of alignment, you're in a state of desperation. Okay. This is kind of full circling back to that woman on the plane. You guys, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I've, that I, my mother was an alcoholic my whole life. Like my mother and I kind of have a relationship. Um, It's not like active. I love her to death, man. She spent, not by choice, my father did this to her, she spent a majority of her life, she's 67, 68 now, on pills that my father got her addicted to and kept her on, but also was constantly feeding her alcohol. She was cross-faded a majority of my life. And so there's that mother wound there, knowing that she was there but not actually there. And I can't even tell you how many times I've seen my mother in the exact same condition as that woman on the plane. Okay. It's, 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 it is scary, dude. My mother once tried to flip the Bronco that I was driving. She was passenger seat when we were, I was driving her back home and she thought I was the devil. All of a sudden, boom, she looked over at me in complete complete terror dude absolute terror i'm driving we have been driving this vehicle 45 minutes already and all of a sudden she just looks over at me and she is fully immersed in the illusion and hallucination that i am the devil driving her into the pits of hell it's just her and i on the freeway there's nobody else around us like i don't talk about this story often and she was so terrified that she tried to flip the vehicle. She had even said, I would rather die than go to hell. And so what she would, while I'm driving, she's on this side of the vehicle, passenger side, she unstrapped the belt and she grabbed the wheel and she was yanking this wheel at like 65, 70 miles an hour. We're moving out of LA on the 405 freeway. And I'm sitting here driving sober. I wasn't drinking like, cause I knew I had to take care of my mom. And so she's flipping out, dude. And I mean like 100% conviction that I am the literal devil incarnated and I am driving her to hell. And so she, I'm sitting here and she's yanking the wheel and she pulls the emergency brake. She pulls, was it the emergency brake? She pulls the emergency, I haven't told this story in 10 years. She rips this emergency brake. Maybe it's not a Bronco, maybe it's something else. She rips this thing and then like we end up all over the freeway. And not only did she pull this brake on me, but I'm now in the fast lane trying to get over because the engine is starting to lock up. 
And, um, and then eventually we ended up getting over. I found this exit and we, we pulled over. I pulled over. She is bawling, bawling, like, like asking for God. She is straight up hallucinating all of this, all of this. And I, we get into this parking lot of like Macy's before it went down. And it's just me sitting in the car trying to like calm my mother down. And she's going banana sandwiches, dude. Like she does not know where she is. She doesn't know what she's saying. She doesn't know what she's doing. She doesn't know that we are safe in a vehicle in a parking lot. She is wholeheartedly believing that we are in hell or something like that in, in this complete demonic, just, this is a crazy story, dude. Like it, it's weird to even tell it again. She doesn't even remember this. She doesn't have a clue. She did not know that that was happening. And the trippier part about that stuff is that I've hallucinated many times. And I'm telling you, dude, if you've never hallucinated, especially from like alcohol, then it's hard to just say, it, it's different than like schizophrenia, dude. I, I guess it's uh, technically, it's almost exactly the same. I'm, I've never been in that space. But my point is, is that your brain doesn't know that it's not real. And my mother, she didn't sleep. She was an insomnia. So not only you relapse, dude, we'll talk about that in a second too. Not only did she not sleep, but she purposely kept herself awake. And we got to remember this, like DTs, when you start to hallucinate, when these things start to happen, they don't start to happen just because of like basic brain deterioration. That is your brain struggling to function, struggling to stay alive. Scott Dune, I, I appreciate you, man. It's struggling to stay alive and it's struggling to make sense. We have, this is why I speak so heavily on sleep, dude. Like sleep is imperative. If we don't sleep, we'll die. We'll literally die if we don't sleep. It's where the healing happens, dude. It's where your, your, your brain says, sends all the signals to your body that it needs to be repaired. This is why this, today is my rest day from the gym and I needed to get good sleep, needed to rest, slept longer. I feel I'm still sluggish because my body is healing from the effort I put in in the gym. Sleep is imperative, dude. If you keep someone awake long enough, they'll literally die, dude. So my mother also didn't sleep, dude. I remember her being up two, three, four, five, six, seven in the morning and then still having to go to work at like eight, dude. I'm almost scared to go to sleep due to scary dreams and voices. I get you. I get you. We'll talk about it. And so here's what happens. Eventually, your brain becomes desperate. When your brain gets desperate and it's trying to get sleep because you're not giving it the appropriate amount of sleep that it needs to function accordingly, it tries to put you in the REM deep sleep, which is where the dreams and all that stuff happen, while you're awake. Your brain is, is struggling so hardcore. It is literally doing its last ditch effort to take any possible opportunity to help you heal. I'm saying this to go, the woman who's hallucinating on the plane, her brain is trying to heal, dude. She's in a, a, a condition that, I, I don't, obviously we don't know exactly what it is, but I know exactly what that looks like. I've sat next to the woman that did that for years. I myself have been in that circumstance. You gotta remember, I'm an ex high functioning alcoholic. I needed 30 shots a day. I know what it's like to casually be walking down the street, opening a door for somebody and feeling and seeing millions of spiders all over the ground, all crawling up my legs in my pants. And I am flipping out inside, but I'm not letting you know, Alexis, I'm not gonna tell you that. Why would I tell you that? Why would I tell you? Alcohol hallucinations, alcohol hallu hallucinosis, never heard of that. Um, but I would never tell you that I'm flipping out, dude. Even, even my closest people, I would never tell you. Because as a high functioning alcoholic, we, we don't drink to get drunk. We don't even drink to catch a buzz. We drink to stop the shakes and to act sober. And the video I just put out is, dude, if, if I had been awake long enough and I was in that deep state of despair with my alcoholism six years ago and I had to get on a flight, you would never know that I took 10 shots before getting on the flight. You would never know that I was drinking at 4 a.m., which is five hours before that plane probably had to take off. You would, you would never know that I had a flask in my lap when I was driving to the airport. The whole job 
of a high functioning alcoholic or someone that's in a deep state of psychosis that needs to function is to mask all of their symptoms. Unfortunately, the masking of the symptoms causes more symptoms. There, com there comes a breaking point. And it feels like that woman there reached that breaking point, which is not something that she, you know, was prepared for. But what she, this is the trippy part. This is the, this is the craziest part about it all. It's real. <laughs> you may not see it, but her brain doesn't know the difference. It is 100% real to her. Your brain's an idiot. It doesn't, hello friend, don't afraid. Your brain, when you think about something, your brain reacts as if it is happening. Thinking about a car accident, your brain sends the same signals as if you're watching a car accident. Us as passengers on the plane or watching someone have a very true, very real, very accurate experience that we're not invited to. Thank you for the rose. We're not invited to that. That's because she's literally stepped into a whole new state a whole new dimension of consciousness in her brain. She didn't do anything specifically to get there. That is a lot of stress. That's a lot of anxiety. That is a full on breaking point. And the way she's reacting is, listen to what I'm saying. The way she's reacting is that it's unfamiliar. She, she knows or has a very deep sense of what is real and what is not. What she was seeing is absolutely real and absolutely true to her, which means we need to respect that as if it were true. It doesn't mean we need to act it, but that woman had a very real break in her, her, her psyche. Now, there, we, we could take this a thousand different directions. I say this because I know what it's like to have that break. That break, those DTs, that's how I ended up in the hospital. I've slept with dead bodies in, in, the, in the bed next to me. I've watched demons in the corner of the room staring at me. I've watched envelopes turn into angry Legos and literally move around the whole room. Like an envelope. I didn't even know it was an envelope. Someone told me later, like, I was like, that, that envelope is angry. That thing is angry. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm watching it move around the room. Like I'm in bed surviving liver failure. And this thing is literally like they're watching me in bed do this. And I'm watching this Lego block angry with like red eyes move around the room while there's a dead body next to me. I'm in a hospital. So I'm assuming that the body that's next to me is just another patient in the hospital. But there, I was the only one in the room. I was told years later that I was I was so I, I went into such deep rest that I was the only one in that room. Why do I remember the guy in the corner? Why do I remember the guy next to me? Why do I remember the body in the bed? Because it was real. My brain was struggling. It 100% was under the assumption that I was a room full of other patients. Nope, it was just me. It was just me. <laughs> Got it. Hey, Derek, good to see you, man. Thanks for swinging through. The tr it, it, not, Aside from that, I guess the, the hospital had this like massager thing for your feet. So like if you have like neuropathy or, or like poor blood flow, they strap this thing to your feet and it shakes your feet. <laughs> they didn't shake my feet with that, but that machine was at the edge of the bed. And that specific machine has these like octopus arms. I'm dead serious with this, dude. Those octopus arms, <laughs> they turned into like 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 uh like 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 shop vac tubes right and they were moving reaching underneath the sheets and grabbing my feet dude like this is like when i when i see this woman i'm like i know exactly how you feel dude i know exactly how you feel it is and you're you literally can't catch your breath dude and because you're in such a deep state of anxiety plus you're hallucinating you gotta keep in mind, I, I gotta say, I got chills thinking about this because I'm like having like a flashback to this stuff. Her brain is having a, hey Liz, thank you so much. She's having a 100% real response. She's having a normal response to an abnormal situation. That woman knows for a fact that what she's seeing, they didn't buy a ticket. <laughs> She's conscious of what, conscious enough to know that it's not real, 
but not capable of enough to ignore it. Was that that was that a video? Yeah, there's there's a there's a video of a woman who was like hallucinating on a plane. Dude, dude, can this cause numbing, mumbling and stuff? Yeah, my boyfriend does this when he's trying to sober back up 100%. Absolutely. As your brain is starting to to fire, as your brain is starting to heal itself, as your brain is trying to create neural activity, you may mumble. As a matter of fact, I used to I used to do this thing. I, I learned recently. It's called a, a trauma grunt, where um, when I was healing for years, I would do this like low vibration hum when I was resting, and it was like, mm. and people would record me. My former fiance would record me healing. She didn't know that that's what it was. Like I can't hold it against her because she just thought it was funny. But I learned years later. Um, <laughs> did your mom bang Polly short? Yeah, that's my dad. Um, and what happened is, is that you, as your brain is attempting to heal, attempting to come back to reality, it sends misfiring signals. D, what's up, girl? So stoked to see you. It sends all these signals, man. Sometimes that makes us mumble. Um, sometimes that'll make us just act out. It, sometimes that'll make us um, um, say things we don't mean. Sometimes that it will sleepwalk. Um, sometimes we will have nightmares. Sometimes we will hear things. Sometimes we will smell things. Sometimes we'll feel things. Remember, dude, alcohol is absolute trauma. Kimberly, what's up, girl? Kimberly, you probably understand what I'm talking about. Actually, I'm sure you do. We're talking about like deep state hallucinations, specifically from alcohol withdrawals, moving into that state of psychosis, not just while you're drinking, but specifically afterwards, dude. We see things like even to this day, to this day, man, I have deep like post DT, like, what, what is that? Uh, what is that? CPTSD? Uh, stress or whatever? It, it, it's CPTSD, but it's from the DT. So what it means is like, if I see something like this out the corner of my eye, I, my brain makes it move. And I have to go like, oh, it's just a little, it's just a little dude. <laughs> if I see something dark on the counter, boom, like my brain automatically assumes that it's a bug. And this, this happens to me like all day long. Yes, thought my dad was hanging around. He had been deceased for over a year at that point. Holy jeez, Kimberly. Okay, so I, I gotta show some mad love to Kimberly here. So you see here popping in, um, we, we got the, the chance to work together and she's done some absolutely phenomenal work, dude. She's she's taken it to the, to the brink and came back and she's doing extremely well. Um, I, I got a chance to meet her and hang out with her when she was at her worst. And it, it was it was it was a different kind of thing. And she's saying that when she was at that space, that her deceased father was in her peripherals. She was seeing her father that hadn't, hadn't been there for years. I remember that conversation, girl. I remember you telling me about that because that was that was in your house. Like that's that's where it all happened. And that is that's a full on trauma response. And the craziest, most interesting part about this, you're on day three, no drinking, dude, Andy, that's that's amazing. Hey, tomorrow you and I are the same amount of sober, dude. 100%. <laughs> Can't get more sober than sober, dude. The hard work is done tomorrow. Stick it out. Do one more day. That doesn't mean you're fixed. It means you're in the arena. Now we got to put in some work. We got we got some fighting words. <laughs> that is so badass, dude. I'm so proud of you, bro. That's the hard work. The hard work is getting through up to day four. If you go to the hospital tomorrow and they run your blood, they're going to be like, there's nothing here. <laughs> that's how sober you are. Now, recovery is different, dude. Recovery is putting energy into someone that doesn't need to get sober. You become someone that doesn't want to go back down that path or develops a healthy relationship with alcohol where it's not obviously uh, removing value from your life. Um, going back to Kimberly real quick, dude, she's straight up saying that, you know, when she was at her worst, which was a very, very, very Polly Shore similar situation that I was in, she was, I remember I had to yell at her, girl, get to the hospital, like straight up had to scream at her numerous times. Dude, Sparta kiss? I was Sparta kicking, dude, straight up. It worked though. She took care of herself and she got the support that she needed, right? And I'm super, super thankful for that. But at her worst, dude, she was seeing her, her dad, man, hallucinating all that stuff. Dude, it's super trippy, man, what happens. Yeah, it did. Yeah, dude, I'm so proud of you, girl. Like, the best of us usually take it the furthest, but we also grow the most at the same time. And one of the lessons that I heard today from 
uh, Sadhguru is he says, you, you basically don't want to disrespect um, the pain because it's the most invaluable lesson you're ever going to learn. And I say this because most people, we've got 222 amazing humans here. Most people aren't going to be blessed with the burden of the pains that we go through. They're going to have this, sad guru is good, super duper good, very simple. It, his, it's not just philosophy, man. It's, it's, beyond, it's beyond that. But the truth with that is, is our deepest pains are our greatest lessons. And I know that sounds like toxic positivity, but I don't take back a single pain that I've ever had. If I could be twice as happy and all I had to do was go through all that stuff again, I would easily do it. I would go through another 16 years of torture to be twice as happy as I am right now. <laughs> 100%. A222 been hitting all day? Bro, you're in alignment, G-Funk. That is so amazing. Nas in the building. What up, dude? I'm so stoked. Divine, what's going down? How can you help someone when they say they need more uh, to prevent a seizure? Uh, the reality with this is two things. If they've had a seizure before, then they're already doing it wrong. <laughs> if they've had a seizure before and continuing to drink, they need medical assistance. That means that they've lost their capability or are at minimal capacity, capacity to take care of themselves from a medical standpoint. It means that they need to go to the hospital. They need somebody there. Detoxing at home, detoxing and all that stuff, that's how I ended up in the hospital, was thinking that I could do it by myself. No, that's when I woke up bright yellow, throwing up blood, ended up in, in, in four hospitals, okay? So if somebody's sitting here going, I need alcohol, otherwise I'm gonna have a seizure, that means that they have passed the point where they use alcohol to feel alive, they need alcohol to stay alive. This is an extreme dependency. That's an addiction. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, that's what an alcoholic is. An alcoholic, please listen, is someone who is physically addicted, divine, and emotionally dependent on the poison. They basically use it as maintenance at that point. It means that alcohol is no longer fun. Alcoholics drink because they have to, not because they want to. <laughs> If they don't drink, they have a problem. Alcoholics don't drink to get drunk. They drink to act sober. They drink to maintain. They drink to get through the day. They drink to manage the symptoms caused by the thing, caused by the poison, right? If you don't have that addiction, you're not an alcoholic. But how do you think that alcoholic got there? by practicing alcoholic behavior. So if we have a high tolerance man, we're, we're shotgunning all this stuff, we're beer bonging, we're partying every night, we're drinking specifically to get drunk, drinking specifically to back, black out, drinking specifically to pass out, we're drinking always because we're sad, because we're depressed, because we're happy, because we're bored, because we got nothing to do. All we wanna do is celebrate. If, if we're drinking because we're in physical pain, drink it because we're in emotional pain, spiritual pain, drink it because you got bills, drink it because you have anxiety, drink it because you got depression, all of those things is a reflection of what an alcoholic would do. But an alcoholic needs to utilize the substance to be able to handle those circumstances where most of us are still practicing drinking the exact same way an alcoholic would, doing the exact same amount of damage that an alcoholic would do. We just can't call ourselves an alcoholic because we don't have an addiction. Personally, that's worse. <laughs> that's like, <laughs> that's like, this is gonna sound really messed up and I hopefully I don't get canceled for this. That's like saying that you have an extremely low IQ by choice. <laughs> you look at someone that has an actual like, uh, like cerebral damage and they literally, that's the best that they could function. And we are just pretending to be like that and that's as good as we're gonna get. We're acting like someone with a low IQ. They actually get to use their condition to go like, dude, I had a head injury. Like I was born this way. When we're just going, oh, I just drink myself silly and act like you, that, that's even worse. It, it, keep in mind, I didn't realize this until like years, 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 years after the, it, it got really, really, really bad, right? So I say that with absolute love. It, it's just it's just a horrible circumstance. Um, so that's what I needed. It's just to stop withdrawal. It was no longer fun at all. Pure hell. 100%, Mandy. That was me too. It's, that's what I was saying. I was, I'd be up at 4 a.m. in it, at 4 o'clock. Keep in mind, I, I'd be asleep at like 2 o'clock. And then 4 o'clock. 
Like I, the second I had my last drink is the second I started my withdrawals. The OG, thank you so much. And so at four o'clock, I'd have another shot, maybe six o'clock, have another shot. You would think that having a drink, you'd be asleep, but alcohol doesn't let you sleep. Eric, thank you so much. Alcohol literally disrupts the chemical balance in your brain and body and keeps you in a light state of rest. Or we're going to say a deep state of rest, but not a full state of sleep. This is, once again, those that are struggling with substances, those that are struggling with alcohol, those that are struggling with insomnia, all of these things. If we do that long enough, our brain gets desperate, dude. And then we start to hallucinate. And we start to have all these like really profound experiences, dude. And here's the craziest part. This is where it gets even worse. Donna Fay. When you start seeing the demons and you start feeling and you're you're in high alert, not only is your nervous system completely disrupted, yet yeah, took you three months to get your body to sleep again, 100%. Not only is your nervous system disrupted, you're in constant fight or flight mode, right? And you're hallucinating or on high alert, you're drinking. This is why like people who you obviously dabble with, with glass and all that stuff, do what they do, act the way they act. They're on high alert. Nervous system is completely wrecked. They always think that something's happening. They always get, they're always on the edge. And then they see, they see something. Okay, that's not it. They're constantly in this mode. And it looks like they're searching for something. But the trippiest part about it, while they're, in order to stop looking for things, they need the thing that's making them look like that. They need more alcohol. They need more of the substance. Because once their nervous system is wrecked, they need to subdue it with more of the toxin. And then this is where it gets even more messed up. The safest place for someone with an addiction is on the substance. That's when their body is less in fight or flight mode. That's when their system is relaxed. That's when they're chilling and going like, all right, I just hate everybody, but at least I'm not trying to jump off the building. At least I'm not trying to do this. At least I'm not on the hunt. At least I'm not nervous. At least I'm not acting wild. At least I'm not scaring people, right? This is, this is why they have methadone clinics and all these different things, dude. I appreciate you. This, this is the unfortunate cycle. Um, Marty, what do I do? It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, smart guy right here. <laughs> How do you decrease the cortisol? Um, cortisol is going to spike in between drinks anyway. You want to have, you do want to have cortisol in your body. You just don't want to have a lifestyle where it's out of whack. So the, the way we say this is at this moment, dude, you have roughly 1400 individual chemicals moving through your mind and body. Okay. Just like this. Right. So this is water <laughs> and cranberry juice. And then what, what's the other one? Um, is it mango? Ra raspberry. So cranberry, raspberry and water. This is my body. Okay. So that specific cocktail is what I call life. So I'm a happy, healthy, happy-go-lucky ninja dude doing whatever, vibing high, poly shore, smiling all the time. I say, listen to what I'm saying. My life isn't like this crazy roller coaster. It's not as vibrant as this background. This is just for show, okay? So look pretty. I literally am in my house all day long. Maybe I create some content. Maybe I'm working with some clients. Maybe I'm building some websites. Maybe I'm designing something. I'm in the gym and then I'm back here. Like my whole life is not, oh my God, he's got like 25 friends, man. He's always out and he's the life of the party and he does this and he does all the, bro, I don't even go outside. If I'm not going to the store <laughs> or going to the gym, you don't see me. <laughs> you just don't. I don't text people. I don't have all these crazy conversations. Five people have my number and we don't talk. My life is not magical, but why am I having more fun than almost every single person that I know? Every person, they're at work, they're doing this, they're doing all these things, not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough. They don't have enough, they don't have enough money, they're not thinking the right thoughts, they're not feeling the right feelings, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, their partner, their, their, their actions, their, their ideas. They feel all of these things, right? And that is the cocktail. That is the chemical balance in their brain and body that's making them feel like they're not enough, like they're not doing enough, like they, like they don't have enough. So because that cocktail, Kelly, looks and feels this way, they determine that is truth. And then here's, I feel like I'm dying. <laughs> exactly. So you've got these chemicals 
that are pulling you towards, I'd rather be dead, bro. <laughs> I already feel like I'm dying. I might as well just end it. I get that. That's low dopamine, low serotonin, endorphin withdrawal, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. So I say this to go, why is it that I'm capable of having this experience? Remember, this is my experience. Why is my life experience so outer worldly, so astronomical, so beautiful that I can't even describe it? It's because I've designed a life that I love to live. No, I don't have a Lamborghini. I'm not sitting on billions, dude. I don't have girls running around, man. I'm not just buying stuff. I choose to take care of me. I eat, I drink water, I cook for myself, I go to the gym, I <laughs> get outside. We're twins. We, I, 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 don't, I take care of me, that's it. The, base, the basic things that I do keep me at this high vibrational state. They, it keeps me, even on my worst day, I'm still vibing super duper duper high. So when I go meet people, I have energy and I've got all this stuff and I have a lot to say, right? And I express myself, I dance, I do all these things. N nobody knows what I'm doing because I'm really not, it's simple, exactly. It is simple. I have a simple, simple, simple life, right? Simple. As a matter of fact, I say this all the time. Happiness is life simplified. And I'll tell you this, this is how simple I like to make my life. Where am I from? I live in Nashville, but I was born and raised in California. I don't care if, if someone came in and took everything I have, nothing would be different. <laughs> oh man, they took the rainbow light. <laughs> so what? I don't care. It's not mine. I don't own it. It's just money. It's whatever. It changes absolutely nothing. I don't own this. I own it. I'm in possession but it doesn't own me. Take the iPad, dude. You want this light? You could have it. Here's a spare tree. I spent too much on this thing anyway. I don't care, dude. You want that couch? Dude, it's beat up. I don't care. You have all my dishes. I'm not attached to anything. I'm attached to me and that's it. As long as I got me, I'm good. I know what to do with nothing. I know what to do with everything. And that's the balance. Because I focus so heavily on that and because that matters to me, I live a completely simple life. I know undoubtedly that fun isn't outside the house, that it is fun because I'm outside the house. I'm the reason the fun happens, absolute freedom. I'm the reason the pain happens. I'm the reason the awesomeness exists. Without me, there's no awesome, right? So I take on that personal responsibility and go like, okay, do I want this cool little, is this, is this gonna add value to my life? Like, what is it? It's just a little desk lamp. I guess <laughs> it lights up my fingers. Oh, look at these nails. It's just whatever. So my point with all this is that we use substances and we use all of these things to either pull us into a space that we prefer or out of a space that we don't. Is, is it a Sparta kiss or a Sparta hug, right? Woo! See that? I didn't mean for that to happen. So that's, that's really the whole point of it is that we want to find ourselves in such a condition, such a position, that we're cool with whatever happens, right? We think that we're not supposed to feel bad. I haven't clowned for a while. So good to see you. Hey, dude, so good to see you. Don't let the things you own end up owning you, 100%. That is Fight Club, one of my favorite movies on the entire planet. That's where I learned it from. Then I started practicing that. Actually, I want to I want to push this button and see what it does. Let's do this. Ah! is word okay and uh <laughs> and so that's when when you start taking care of yourself you realize that you really don't need anything that th there's things that you prefer when you've got less stress not that there's less things that stress you out when you actually become someone that doesn't get stressed with the little things with the things that don't matter you start to live a simple life you start to go like who cares if they don't text back? Who cares if I don't get the job? Who cares if I don't get the thing? Who cares if I don't get views on TikTok? Who cares if they don't arrive? Who cares if the scale isn't moving? Who cares if I'm not buff in two weeks? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It literally holds no weight in my existence. It doesn't define me. This is why when you develop a lifestyle that you enjoy, <laughs> You let go of the things that pull you away from feeling good. Spartacus, on your worst day, bro, I'm telling you this, Donna Faye. If, you, if we're, we're hanging out, dude, 
and you are pulling me, you're killing the vibe, it's a hard no, bro. <laughs> nah, bro. Hey, you can stay over there, dude. I'll, I'll take you. You could go Sparta kiss my ass. <laughs> bro, you could go Sparta kiss my ass. I love you, bro, but it's a hard no because I'm not going to sit here and sacrifice my happiness because you're having a bad day and it's really hard for you to manage your own mind. I'm not going to hand the keys over of my universe over to you. You're struggling to handle your own. Why would I give you the keys to my universe? Absolutely not, dude. Paulina, on the other hand, here you go, girl. Take my keys. <laughs> you can mess with my world all you want. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> I trust Spartacus, too. And I trust Kimberly and, and all the cool kids, man. That's, that's really the whole point, is all pain is in the mind. All suffering is in the mind. Our entire life experience is here. And perspective is absolutely everything. This is going to full circle back to the woman on the plane there. Can you imagine how stressed out, how outerworldly, how anxiety ridden that woman had to have been in when life is literally this simple for her brain to go, no, it's too much. You're being charged 28,000. I feel so stressed. Stressing yourself out about it isn't going to change the fact that you've been asked to pay 28. People, I owe people money left and right. Debt is wealth, man. The wealthiest people on the planet are in the most amount of debt. It's, it's money. It's going gonna, it's gonna to show up. You're, you don't have to stress about it. As a matter of fact, here's the thing. If stressing about it worked, you'd have it paid off. <laughs> if working harder worked, you would be rich. <laughs> It, that's not how it works. None of that stuff works like that. So we, we also want to understand that anxiety doesn't change anything but you now. There is absolutely no proof that the anxiety that you have is the reason something is or is not going to work. I want you to think about the last thing that you had anxiety about. Like the last thing that really got your attention. You're like, I can't stop thinking about this, right? And it was just, you were up all night, dude. You couldn't sleep, right? You could barely eat. You were nervous, right? All those things, right? <laughs> Can you prove that it was your sleepless nights and your poor diet and your horrible thoughts and that deep gut feeling was the reason it didn't happen? Can you prove that it was your anxiety, why that friend of yours that was on the plane, why that plane didn't crash and it was because of your anxiety? You can't. There's, it's because it doesn't have any effect on anything. All it does is it changes us so we can't have any effect on what needs our attention. If I'm stressed out, bro, <laughs> I can't focus on what needs. It's just this. I just need to focus on this. But I'm focused on everything else, thinking that if I could just focus on all this stuff, that somehow it'll condense and I'll have the attention span for this guy. Dude, it doesn't change anything. You're allowed not to care about it. It doesn't mean, listen, just because you don't care about it doesn't mean it doesn't matter to you. I got it, bitch, no. I got, you really got it. I'm going to say this again. Just because you don't care about it doesn't mean it doesn't matter to you. Acceptance, 100%. You can care about things without your emotions. Things can matter to you without your conscious thought. There are many, 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 many things that matter to me, but I'm not actively caring about them. Acceptance, 100%. I have care, I'm just not applying it right now. It doesn't need my care. <laughs> it's gonna take care of itself regardless. One of the greatest lessons that I've ever learned is, dude, nobody's thinking about you in the way that you are. <laughs> nobody's waiting for you, bro. <laughs> not. No, no, there's 185 of us here. I guarantee you not a single person was going, where's Cody? I'm sorry to go. Where is he? Is that, was that the anxiety? Me sitting, am I going to sit in anxiety go like, oh, they're waiting for me, dude? No, you guys are having fun drinking your water, taking care of yourselves. And I just happened to show up and I added value to your life. You're adding value to mine. That's the exchange. It would, nothing would be different if I had anxiety for the last two hours expecting to go live because I thought you wanted me here. Changes nothing. It literally changes nothing. The conversation would be exactly the same. Maybe there'd be a heightened talk about anxiety. It is what it is. 
Um, nobody's thinking about you in the way that you are. Dude, nobody is, man. No one's waiting for you. And here's, let's go even further. You don't matter, man. <laughs> I don't matter. Like, it, nothing matters. Like, life has no definitive meaning other than the one you apply to it. When you realize that you don't matter, then you just go like, damn, I could really do anything. Spartacus, you, you have value. You matter, but you don't matter, bro. <laughs> it, it, like you matter but you don't matter you know what i'm saying like there's there's i understand like being a parent or being a partner or someone that depends on you of course you matter there's a, there's a density of matter there but the point is, is that life our life specifically isn't so detrimental that we have to live to such high anxiety and unrealistic and unnecessary standards under the assumption that somebody is thinking about us in the way that we are. Nobody is. <laughs> and even, even if we knew that they were, would that even matter? Who cares? Bro, I'm not available. You can think about me all day long. I'm not showing up. I'm tired. I got to take a nap. I'm going to do my thing. You're going to see me when you see me, regardless of how you feel. I know you think I matter and I hold value, but bro, I'm tired. The answer is no, and you can wait. It, it literally changes nothing. And so when you disconnect from all the things that literally limit our ability to feel alive and be alive jamie thank you so much then we start to live a simple life we go like dude i don't matter it doesn't matter that's the most freeing thing we could ever accept dude i'll tell you this listen to this something else that i, that I recently heard that I, I didn't hear it but i someone referenced it and i was like that's right dude your greatest successes is when no one's looking dude no, no one's paying attention to you. And that's when your success happens. My success isn't here with you. My success is when you don't see me. When I'm taking care of myself, when I'm feeding myself, when I'm getting the right sleep, dude, when I'm drinking water, when I'm doing all these things and you aren't sharing the experience with me, that's when my success is happening, right? I don't worry myself sick over everything, I hate it. Oh, I worry myself sick over everything, I hate it. It has a daily effect on my life. Anxiety is bad, 100%. Anxiety is living in the future, 100%. It's the what ifs. I, I work with someone who has the highest anxiety I've almost ever heard of anybody. And I'm so proud of them for the work that they're doing. And it's because of nicotine. Nicotine is actively disrupting the cortisol levels and all of those things. And extreme anxiety. And it it's anxiety is literally putting your brain so far in the future that it makes it feel impossible to do something here. You're not, you're, remember, your brain is going to react as if it's real. This is why I meditate. This is why I practice mindfulness, like active awareness. And so when my brain starts to drift in my anxiety and I start to think about that IRS bill that's sitting right there and start to think about these other things, I go, that bill is going to be there. It doesn't matter. I can, I can come back. I can be here. I'm with, I'm with you. Imagine where this conversation would go if I was thinking about something else. <laughs> if I was just like, yeah, but the toilet and just, uh, oh, oh, that's right. We're in a conversation. We do that when we're driving. How did I get home? <laughs> but that's, that's, this is, this is why we want to wrangle our thoughts. We, we want to have awareness of what can have our attention, but we want to get good at prioritizing what we want to give our attention to. Jamie, what needs your attention isn't necessarily the thing you want to prioritize. Brandine, thank you. What you can prioritize right now isn't always the thing that needs your attention. What do you want to prioritize? What do you want to give your attention to? And I know when I say that, you go, I, I want to give my attention to the thing that needs my attention. That's an illusion. Unless it's an actual emergency. <laughs> Unless something is literally dependent on your actions. Something bad is going to happen. Or someone's life or even your own life is going to be harder if you're not giving your attention to it. Then the question is, what would you rather be prioritizing right now? Because the truth is that is what needs your attention. It's where you'd rather be giving your attention. As a matter of fact, the majority of the things we'd rather be giving our attention to are the things that bring us peace, the things that help us feel centered, 
So when we come back to the thing that actually needs our attention, we're centered. And we go like, oh, I got this. It's just a bill. I paid it last time. I'm going to pay it next time. It's just the government. It's just them. It's just a text message. It's just an email. It's just the dishes. It's just the laundry. It's just whatever. But we want, when we practice taking care of ourselves, when we start prioritizing our own physical and mental health, all of those things we think need our attention dissipate. Say that again. <laughs> the thing that you want to biscuit, what's up? When you prioritize you, there's two things. There's the things you think need your attention, and there's the things that you want to prioritize and give your attention to. It is very rarely, very rarely, the thing you think needs your attention needs to be prioritized. When you start prioritizing you, you realize that what you'd rather be doing is where your attention should go. Because in serving that perpetual need, true, honest, fulfilling priority, you're gonna be in a better space to handle the things that actually need your attention. You gotta take care of you first, dude. Let the bills wait. <laughs> Let the people wait. Make them wait. I'm not available, dude. It's a no. <laughs> I don't wanna respond to you and I don't owe you an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> but then can drink every weekend. I'm assuming that you don't drink during the week and then you drink every weekend. I'm going through a draw after drinking six, seven drinks a night for months now. First day has been hard. Dude, I'm super proud of you. Check it out, man. I need you to do this three more times, three more days, 72 hours, dude. And then you're going to be 100%. Gina, thank you so much. 20,000, almost 20,000 likes, you guys. I say this because I don't know what I'm going to say. And your thumbs and your likes could push this to the FYP. And you could save someone's life. Dead serious with this. If you haven't followed me, do me that amazing favor. Just hit follow real quick. If you haven't connected with me off of TikTok, not only am I on threads now, but all of my programs, all of my resources are connected to the link in my bio. It says SoberNotSober.com. You guys can ask me questions. Beyond Sober Masterclass, Unlabeled Recovery, Single Shot Method, Beyond Sober Podcast, The Clothing Brand, um, the Recovery Guide, like literally everything is connected to the link in my bio. Um, so moving through this, hang on, my ADHD got the best of me for one, 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 um, one second. Hang on, you said something. Oh, got it. Oh, so withdrawals. Yeah, that's right, dude. Okay, so check it out. You're going to go through a basic withdrawal process for the next couple of days. So many of us that have been drinking six to seven drinks every single night for months, that's considered binging, bro. <laughs> you have lowered your mental health. Your fit, your the chemicals, the chemistry in your brain and body have been adjusted. Okay, it's going. You've caused trauma in your body. Alcohol is a carcinogen. It's a poison. It's a disinfectant. So what's happening is your body has been conditioned to expect a certain amount of alcohol every single night, and now you're not fueling your body with what it's expecting. Now what I need you to do is drink water, dude. Every time you think about alcohol, I want you to drink water. Every time you crave alcohol, I want you to drink water. Every time you feel nauseous, drink water. Every time, I don't care. I want you in that restroom, dude, like every 45 minutes if you can. This is technically to be considered a detox because you are lubricating your system and you're helping your body function. Your liver is still processing the alcohol that's in your bloodstream. Remember, the alcohol is not in your stomach. Yes, it's there in your blood vessels, all that stuff, but... It's in your brain. It's in your blood. It's where your veins are. That's why it's called a blood alcohol level. It's a part of you. It's not just inside you, okay? Alcohol becomes a part of you in the same way that alcohol becomes your personality. If alcohol is something that you do every single day, you don't have a personality because alcohol is providing one to you. And when we stop drinking, we have to develop a personality that isn't dependent on alcohol. This is why so many people are afraid to get sober because they don't think they're going to be funny anymore. They don't think they're going to be confident anymore. They don't think they're going to be strong anymore. They don't think they're going to have the right patience. They don't think joy is going to show up. None of those things. And that's because alcohol has become their personality in which they process life, their emotions, their feelings, their pains, all of that stuff. I'm telling, hey, thank you so much. I'm saying this and this is for everybody. As you start consuming less and less alcohol, more water. As your body starts to heal, as you start to get into that deep sleep and your body starts to, your brain starts to wash itself, white blood cells go where they're supposed to go, your liver's functioning properly, your organs are lubricated and they have the nutrition, they have the nutrients, and they have the rest, right? Remember this, 
if you're constantly putting a poison in your body, that means your body's constantly trying to get that poison out. High stress, high anxiety, more depression. And then the answer to that is more of the thing, alcohol, that's causing all of that. So that's this is why if we've been drinking for an excessive amount of time, our body has to acclimate to a new fuel source so your machine can operate appropriately. It operates with water. <laughs> I know you want juice. I know you want soda. I know you want a beer. Those things are not essential to stay alive. Water is, right? You can't pee on me. So what I do is water, ice, and a splash of cranberry juice. That way it's not too acidic, super light, super cold, super refreshing. And I'll have like four of these a day. And I do this because water is boring. <laughs> I know I needed to live. Uh, soda water. Yeah, I, today I just got like, I tried this new thing, which is like a, it's like a, a sparkling water raspberry lime. And then I started mixing that with some cranberry juice. I'm just like all over the place. Just this little cocktail thing. <laughs> just my little bartender, right? Non-alcoholic drinks. Uh, just trying, you know, water is boring. Water is boring, dude. Like it has no flavor and it tastes like dust. Like, why? <laughs> so I flavor the water. So I don't do those like little drops. I actually do actual juice. So like ocean spray, whatever, just a little bit. Make it fun to drink. When we enjoy drinking the water, we lubricate ourselves better. We're going to get better rest. We're going to get better sleep. Our diet's going to improve. Um, we're going to have more energy. Our mood is going to improve too. Um, I think alcohol messed up my heart rhythm. It, it probably did. Um, it doesn't mess it up, mess it up forever. Um, if you've got um, an irregular heartbeat, once you stop drinking alcohol, that's anxiety. Usually that's anxiety. Um, I have stage four cirrhosis, so I have permanent liver damage. So the only like actual side effects of that six years later is a little bit of high blood pressure. Um, and I keep that under wraps as well. Sugar cravings too, right? You might gain some weight. <laughs> That's the other thing, dude. So going through these next few days, um, no more $100 tabs at the bar. <laughs> yeah, bro. I used to spend a thousand dollars a month on top of getting free alcohol at the bar from all the places that I DJ'd at. Um, how, how did you find out about your liver? Um, I woke up bright yellow and throwing up blood. And then it was because I vomited four stomachfuls of blood into the sink that um, the paramedics were called. And then they, um, I'll find a picture for you. And then once they were called, they rushed me to the first hospital. And then from that first hospital, they sewed up the veins in my throat um, because two veins had opened up and the blood was dripping into my stomach. And then from there, I found out after surgery and after cardiac arrest that my liver was failing. So when I woke up from my nap, this is what I look like. This is this is an edited dude. <laughs> this is what um, extreme Billy Ribbon. I'm trying to get a good angle on this. Guess that's the best. Um, this is Billy Ribbon. So once Billy Ribbon is pushed into your system, we all produce Billy Ribbon naturally. But when your liver is struggling, it produces a ridiculous amount of bilirubin. You start to turn yellow. Um, this is probably one of the best. You see the eyeball? All right, same eyeball. This is this is just how it looks, dude. Um, and yeah, there you go. So this is, I still have that hat. <laughs> it's crazy stuff. It's not funny, dude. Like none of this stuff is a joke at all. This is the most painful experience of my life, dude. Not, not worth it. Not worth it. At all. I beg for that, dude. Like... I, it's an understatement what I could say about that stuff, man. Like I thought that the, the trauma and the pain that I was drinking because of was good enough. Dude, it didn't even touch the amount of pain that I was in when I was surviving that liver failure. And so, you know, I, I say all of that to go, you're either going to drink or you're not. <laughs> and if you are going to drink, don't drink like I do or I did. Because it's a literal carcinogen, dude. If you guys haven't heard, you know, um, what's it called? Ireland. I'm Irish. They are now putting the skull and crossbones and the cancer warnings, just like cigarettes, on alcohol now. So whether you're getting beer, you're getting liquor, you're at a bar, all that stuff, it is in your face that you're literally committing slow self-sabotage. That's, that's just what it is. Some people, they, their mental health is low enough to where that sounds like a good idea, but it never is, man. 
Like it, it wasn't until I was actually dying that I wanted to die because the pain leading up to the moment, it, would, it, was, it was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Is it normal to see yellow in my eyes a bit on the outsides? So if you're seeing it here, it depends. Um, how much did you actually drink a day? About 30 shots, so two bottles. Um, so if you look at like a 750, that is about 13 shot foot, 17 shots, I'm sorry. Between 15 to 17 shots, depending on how you pour them. Um, so two, I don't have another bottle around. So like think, think of like two of these a day of just straight vodka. Um, yeah, like I would just, I would be, like if I was talking to you, I would have a shot glass right here and about like every 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I would pour a shot and I would drink with you and then I would just keep going. I would probably burn through this in about eh, four hours maybe. Um, and then I would go on to another one. And so my, my average drinking was about 12 hours because um, I was in bed, I was depressed, dude. I spent like 14 hours in bed a lot of times, man. Like it was, it was horrendous, dude, absolutely horrendous. Um, but it only takes two beers to have a hangover. I'm glad you're well. Thank you so much, man. Keep in mind, this was six years ago, and this is why I talk about the difference between sobriety and recovery. I haven't reached my success, and you're living that. You got, we got to practice drinking less, man. Um, my success and all of the, the things that I've acquired isn't because I stopped drinking. Keep in mind, if I drink, I'll die. Like, my liver is, is shot, so I can't have alcohol. But I also don't want alcohol. I've been there, I've done that. It's a literal poison, dude. It, it's killed me once, and it's killing millions of people every single day. Literally. <laughs> Handsome Polly Shore. I get that all the time, man, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Polly Shore thinks I look like Polly Shore, too. He's commented on numerous posts saying, hey, man, he really does look like me. He found me on Facebook, too. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, dude, it's just crazy. You're crying? There's, keep in mind, dude. If being hard on yourself worked, it would have worked already. And if you're drinking, quit wasting that alcohol, dude. Drink your water. Like we, we gotta, <laughs> way hotter. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> we have to remember this, dude. I actually, actually just talked to someone who went like three months and then they decided to drink. They just, they just drink for like one night, it was whatever. They're, they didn't have fun with it, they didn't like it. Um, Spartacus. <laughs> They didn't like it, they were beating themselves up, and I'm like, bro, you you went 110 days, and out of those 10 days, you drank once? What are you talking about? You, you think you relapsed? Bro, you didn't even, that was a barely even a lapse, man. You had to figure that out. But my point with this is, if we're struggling, dude, enjoy the liquor. <laughs> Why are we wasting it with tears, man? I can't even tell you, 222, how many times my mother would call me and I'd be sitting in a parking lot in a hospital waiting to pick up my fiance and my mother would just be bawling, dude. Bawling, begging for my forgiveness, dude. Like, I'm like, she's just drunk. She, my mother was a drunk. Like, this is the difference, dude. She, she was not just an alcoholic, she was a drunk. This is, this is I, we gotta talk about this too. My mother drank to get drunk. That's specifically, once, once it hit her lips, she's drinking to get drunk. That's the point. She wants to be out of her mind. She wants to be there. That's her preferred state of being. It used to be. Then there's alcoholics. Alcoholics that need it to function. It doesn't mean they're a functioning alcoholic. Most alcoholics are non-functioning alcoholics, meaning that they're obviously under the influence. They obviously have beer. They obviously have alcohol. They've got the liquor cabinets. They do all that stuff. They have drinks before, during, and after. They're using it to maintain their life. It's a, it's, a, it's a personality trait. They have a major level of dependency and sometimes they get drunk and sometimes they pass out. Then there's functioning alcoholics. People who do not drink to get drunk because a functioning alcoholic where alcohol has become their medicine, there's no point in drinking to black out or pass out or get drunk because that would be considered a waste of alcohol. <laughs> Ronald, I don't know who that is. It would be a waste of alcohol if you can't enjoy your medicine, if you can't function with the medicine. So this is why when I was drinking like that, I would drink for 12 hours. You would never know. That's why I put that video out. You would never know that I was hallucinating when we were in a conversation. You would never know that I see a dead body over there. You'd never know that I'm struggling with DTs because I'm drinking through it. I'm drinking to act sober. I'm drinking to numb or to diminish the amount of physical and, and psychological symptoms, tremor help, one second, um, uh, physical symptoms that I was dealing with. 
And so we go, this goes back to the woman on the plane. She, she's in that position where her brain is just taking it too far, where she couldn't cognitively hold things under wrap. It had gone too far. Thank you so much for the bear. <laughs> it had just gone a little too far. And who knows what her conditions is? That's stress, that's anxiety, that the, 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 the breathing, that 100% feels either medicated or alcohol related, 100%. That is a deep state of fear and terror, a true terror. It means that her brain had taken it a little too far. And that's what my mother sounded like on the phone, sounded like in the car, sounded like at home. She felt like that, she would talk to me about certain things, she would say things. She would, she would describe things that weren't real, that were true, probably both, Frankie, all of that stuff. And the trippiest part about that is once again, that woman reminded me of my mother because my mother took medication and drank alcohol. This is why we don't mix stuff, dude. This, there's alcohol physically affects the way you deliver yourself, man. And she was fighting through that anxiety with absolute terror and conviction which is the trippiest part. And this is why I'm saying the severity of her hallucinations or what she believed to be true was so advanced that it literally affected her 3D world. Mushrooms and alcohol. It, you may see something like that, but if you were to do mushrooms and alcohol, um, depending on how drunk you are and how much mushrooms you took, you would, you would that would be, oh, three hats? <laughs> Word, thank you so much. That would be a very, very interesting experience. And the, the difference with this is most people, most people that use um, psilocybin as a medicine, which is what it is, psilocybin saved my life, dude. I was suicidal at 14. Like it, it changed my life. It's the reason I'm alive. It stopped me from dying. It, it, that's a whole other story. But the point is, is merging an actual medicine, psilocybin, with an actual poison, not new. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, how do you feel about Kratium? However you use, uh, this it's called Kratom. Um, very interesting. Um, actually spoke with someone, um, her very, very sweet. I got a chance to, to be on her podcast. Um, I believe it's called the bright side of something like that. Uh, her name's Melissa, super sweet. And, uh, I posted some videos with her or from that podcast. Um, and we talked about Kratom. Um, Kratom is a substance that people have been taking to curb not just nicotine, but alcohol withdrawals. Um, and in certain conditions, people have been known to get healthy results. Just like any other substance, it is highly addictive, dude. Highly addictive. And I know people who can't stop taking it. They started with alcohol and then, and then started with nicotine. And then they started using Kratom to curb the symptoms. And then what happened is they figured out their symptoms and they broke their addiction or dependency to the primary, but then realized that the second that they start to pull off of Kratom, that now they're having withdrawals with Kratom. Um, it, it, it could be abused 100%. And I believe my understanding on it, my research on it, and what I've been told is it's like synthetic method, synthetic heroin. I'm trying not to get canceled with this. I could be totally wrong but I believe that's what it is, um, or it has those types of effects. And so obviously that's incredibly, incredibly um, addictive. Um, tremor suggestions, we're switching topics real quick. Tremor suggestions, the first thing is to relax. Nexotron is gonna help you too, also highly addictive. Any type of, even, look, I say this because the doctors, we're gonna get back to tremors. The doctors put me on Baclovin and I didn't know that I was on Baclovin for like six or seven months. And Baclovin is a muscle relaxer, dude. They, I didn't know that they use that to curb alcohol cravings. And so when I was recovering, I was also putting a, a, an, like a, a full-on pharmaceutical in my body. And I was becoming addicted to that. I didn't know. I thought it was just another one of the, uh, the vitamins because they had me on 19 pills a day. Four handfuls a day plus... Uh, lactulose, crazy amount, dude. I'm telling you, it was insane. My stomach always hurt. I was always sick. I was always in the bathroom for like for months, for almost a year. It was like this. Um, and so Baclovin is highly addictive and backing off of that has its own withdrawals as well. So the trippiest part, once I found out that they had me on Baclovin, 
I then, Liam, thank you so much. I then was like, no, no, no. I don't want, I don't want anything in my body. I already broke this addiction. I'm not dependent on this at all. I'm an ex, I'm a, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I don't want to be on pills. So I spent nine months slowly decreasing my baclofen intake. So it was starting with three quarters and then a half and then a quarter and then like a 15th or whatever. And then it took me like nine months to get off that. And then I had my life back. Like it was super crazy. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not on lactulose anymore. I was, on, I was only on lactulose for about six months. Um, but that was because of the ammonia in my brain. Uh, my brain was swelling, all kinds of crazy stuff. I also had ascites, so my stomach. Um, I looked nine months pregnant. Um, see if I can find a picture for you guys. Um, that pregnant, it, like I'm dead serious, dude. Like it, it was like it was like having a beach ball on your stomach, dude. Let's see if I can show you this. Um, so you see the yellow skin. You see the yellow in my face, dude. It's more like orange. Can you see that big ass belly? <laughs> this thing is massive. This is a little weird. Yeah, let's see if I could, I don't know if I could show you this. Let's see how I can, I guess that's it. Anyway, this is a huge belly right here. And I'm actually getting my heart checked to see if there's any like bubbles in my heart. But this was all fluid. It fluid and then my liver was swollen. And because of that, I see that Miss Tay Tay. My, my stomach was massive and it was hard as a rock, dude. And I'm trying to keep this angled here. There you go, it's a little bit better. Um, super duper hard, you couldn't touch it, dude. It hurt everything. Um, my liver was like the size of a football. In, in dude, it was, it was like that for, goodness, about two months I had ascites. And so they had me on lactulose and water pills. And so because of that, I was in the bathroom like every 15, 20 minutes, dude just trying to get the fluids out, dude. I have this love-hate relationship with the restroom, dude. <laughs> it's a no, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, but it was good for me, dude, it got my body back. Um, so do you get infections, hang on. Do you get infections in your lower leg from drinking? Um, I don't know anything about infections in your lower leg, but if you are developing ascites, you might get some swelling in the ankles, swelling in the wrists, swelling in the throat, obviously swelling in the belly if you're retaining fluids. Um, your face might round out a little bit, but I don't know about any specific infections associated with alcohol, um, unless, I wouldn't even say yeast. <laughs> gout, I had gout too, and that's because of the acids from all the juice, acids from all of the uh, liquor. Um, that was from the actual toxins that's in alcohol, and it fried my throat. That's actually what fried the veins in my throat. This is, that's called esophageal varices. And lots of people get it. I talk about it. Sometimes they'll throw up and there'll be blood in their vomit. Um, Suboxone, yeah, another one of those things is gonna help you um, practice drinking less alcohol. Either it's gonna make you sick or it's gonna make you not crave alcohol. Here's, here's a trip, dude. I don't care what you guys do. Um, what did I drink? I drank everything but the, the liquor that did me in was vodka. Like it went from like top shelf stuff down to I just needed to live. It went to down, like $10 bottles of Svetka. <laughs> it was the most amount of alcohol I could get for the least amount of money. Um, I don't care which, what you guys do. If you guys are struggling, you're, you're focusing on sobriety or recovery, it doesn't matter which direction you go. You're, you're, you gotta figure it out. Um, and here's one of the things that I've noticed. If you are going to take care of yourself, it's going to happen. If you don't want to, it's just not gonna happen. And I know this 100%. Everyone that I've worked with, including Kimberly, who took it to a whole nother realm, she eventually had to reach her rock bottom and then she took care of herself. She did what was necessary. Sometimes it has to get exceedingly worse before we even really truly commit to the recovery. I had my calendar open for eight months, dude. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people got on my calendar. 5% of them showed up. And then the 1% of them that actually needed my support didn't even need my support. They had, they knew, they knew what they had to do to start with. And all the only difference is me going, you got this, you got this, let's go, let's, you got this. And they took care of themselves and they grew and they got not just got sober, but they started their recovery journey. They're happier and healthier than ever. So I say this to go, whether you're using a pharmaceutical, uh, a pill prescribed by a doctor, you're going to AA, you're thinking about detox, rehab, you want to get into therapy, 
You want to join one of my programs that are literally revolutionary, rebel, revolutionary, beyond sober masterclass, graduate with a certificate in sobriety, or you want to replicate what it's like to work with me personally with the unlabeled Re recovery program, no matter what you choose, even if you choose to use a single shot method or just practice drinking less, it all comes with the level of commitment. Do you want this, man? Do you want this? Not just, do you want to not miss dorky? Yeah, I read that right. Not just do you not want to feel bad, but do you actually want to feel good? Spartacus, man. You know what I'm saying? Like when you when we're first talking, you're like, I just don't want this. No one cares about what you don't want. You don't even care about what you don't want. Until you get clear with what you do want, then all of your, your attention is going to go, in, go towards not hurting yourself. But not hurting yourself isn't healing yourself that's what sobriety and recovery provide but this is why it's so important that we examine ourselves and go what is it that i actually want i want to be happy man i want to be healthy i want to be productive i want to be fulfilled i want to feel abundant i want to be at peace man i want to love myself i want to love other people dude i just want to love being alive i want to be excited to open my eyeballs dude when we get clear on these things and get specific with what we actually want and stop talking about what we don't want, then we actually start taking action towards that because our brain, remember this, if your brain will react to that negative stuff that you're thinking about and cause anxiety, then your brain will positively react to the stuff you're thinking about and create motivation. So the struggle isn't drinking less alcohol or consuming less of the substance. It is thinking more about where your actions are taking you. If what you're doing right now with every single sip of water you're taking is moving you one step closer towards a good night's sleep and being excited to wake up tomorrow, then you're moving in the right direction. But if you're talking about, I can't sleep and it's this and it's that, none of those thoughts, none of those actions, and definitely none of those feelings and emotions are gonna help you get a good night's sleep. So we need to shift our focus it regardless of where we're at and go, you know what, dude, I'm going to set a bedtime sleep tips. I'm going to set a bedtime. I'm being, this is my sleep regimen. I am off. Everything's I'm out of my living room. I'm in the bedroom, right? I even just put a TV in there today. I'm in that room and I am winding down at 845. I'm an old guy, only 38, dude. That's because I'm up at 4am, but look, I'm in bed by eight, asleep by 1030. Do. I love being up at four, five, six and getting directly into meditation. I drink water before bed. I drink water all day long. That's gonna improve sleep, improve mood, it's gonna help you relax, right? I'm not going to put a whole bunch of processed foods. I'm not gonna eat a whole bunch right before I go to sleep so my stomach hurts or my body is working exceedingly hard while I'm trying to rest like tacos. <laughs> I'm not going to overdo it. I'm not going to stress my machine out before I go to bed. I'm not going to get face deep into all this negative stuff that my brain is going to my brain is going to actively react to. I'm not going to watch these true crime documentaries. I'm not going to watch a horror movie. I'm not going to scroll on like all this bum fight type aggressive breakup stuff on TikTok. I'm not going to imbi imbibe a bunch of tox toxicity that I may take into my sleep. I'm going to prepare for rest. And that's the last like hour and a half, two hours of my night is literally preparing to go to sleep. That's relaxing, that's chilling out, that's disconnecting, drinking water. And then right before I go to sleep, I'm listening to my affirmations. As I'm literally falling asleep, dude, my affirmations are playing. So I'm in deep, I'm falling asleep and my brain is highly pro programmable at that point. And so because I'm relaxed and just receiving information, I'm listening to all the things that I want to think first when I wake up. Then I wake up. <laughs> and then the first thing I do is play those same affirmations again. So I program my brain with the same exact affirmations I fell asleep with. So I end my day and start my day with the thoughts and feelings that I want to think and feel. That's how Amanda's in the building. What's up, girl? I love you. And that's how I want to think and feel. And that is how I start my day. I start my day on the right foot. It doesn't matter who's on that side, who's on this side. It doesn't matter which way I roll off the bed because I have programmed myself to go, I'm excited to see Amanda. Oh my goodness, she's so amazing. Every time I see her, my heart goes pitter patter. 
That is how I program my day. So when Amanda shows up, I'm like, oh my God, there she is. I, I've been expecting this. I've been expecting good things all day long and look what happens. <laughs> Same, you see what I'm saying with this? So the way we program our day is a reflection of literally how we want to live life. So I say all of this for us to get extremely clear on what it is we want. You don't want less shit. You want more of something else. Alcohol and substances are going to help us escape a, a, away from where we don't want to be. But what's more important is what are we escaping into? Thank you so much, Zen. Are we escaping into something that's good for us? Or is all we're doing escaping away from something we don't want? Amanda knows what it's like, dude. I've seen all your posts recently, girl. I, I know you've been escaping away from things you don't want. But are you escaping into things you do want? That changes the whole game, dude. The whole game. So I say this to go, my jaw's starting to hurt. I got to cook dinner. And I'm going to start winding down here in just a little bit. I love you so much. Goodness gracious. Thank you for hanging out with me. I realized it was Thursday a little while ago. I was like, what day is it? It's Thursday. Goodness gracious. I sincerely, sincerely appreciate you. Thank you for the follows. Thank you for the support. 28,000 likes. You are absolutely amazing. Anne's in the building. She's still here. I love you, girl. I sincerely appreciate you. Um, if you haven't followed me, feel free to do that. If you haven't connected with me with the link in my bio, feel free to do that. You could ask me a question. I'll respond to you. Um, I've got a bunch of amazing tools. Obviously, there's a recovery programs and guides and all the fun stuff, man. Um, it's good just to stay connected off of TikTok specifically because if something happens, we can still stay connected. Um, I'm over on Facebook and YouTube, and now I'm on Threads. If you guys haven't jumped on Threads yet, it's like the Instagram version of Twitter. I just jumped on there. I've got a, hundreds and hundreds of people that are connected with me. Very excited over there. I'm going to be talking a little bit more nitty gritty. You notice that I'm not cursing so much over here. You notice that these topics aren't too aggressive. I'm going to be doing a lot more shows. I'll be doing a lot more uh, aggressive uh, conversational pieces. I may start be uh, may start doing some interviews soon, and I'm going to be putting all of that information over on Threads. So if you don't have a Threads account, it's worth looking into. Five million of us have already signed up over there. It is absolutely free, and it's linked to your Instagram account. So if you're following me there, it'll just kind of pull you over to Threads as well. Um, with that, I love you. Thank you so, so much for being exactly who you are. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for hanging out with me. You could be anywhere in the world and you decided to chill with me. I truly, truly appreciate you. And I look forward to connecting in the future. I will be live very, very, very soon. And I'm very excited to have the time back to be here with you. Lachey, you know what I'm talking about, girl. With that said, do me a favor, right? Just like my mother always says, just without the anxiety, Take care of you, please. Just just take care of you. That's it. Just